Quit playing yourself. Uh, yo, quit playing. Hey. Quit, 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 quit playing yourself. Radio UTD. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Mercury Morning News. Uh, well, today we're going to be talking. We're going to be talking about a variety of things, but we're going to start off with talking to Alina San about the laptop stand at UTD, the loaner programs, and uh, and how that's going to look like moving onwards and upwards into the future. But uh, first, first off, my constant co-host, uh, Amanda Maria Maceda. How are you doing? I, I, Ben, I just got out of a intense presentation on x-ray diffraction and crystallography, and it went pretty well, so. Bam, we got it. And uh, I am... It, and I am obviously the other constant co-host, Ben Nguyen. I am now the managing editor. Wait, no, I'm not. Hold up. In. Yes, you are. I believe so. A week so. and a half. I'm oh, okay, yeah. The Yay, managing editor ben. at the Mercury. And I just lugged up my desk uh, from my car after we shot another episode. I was too lazy to do it for the past two days. Classic. <laughs> And we're going to start off. We're going to start off with talking to Elena about the laptop standard. What is it? Let us in on this. Does this mean that I just have to shell out a, you know, a few thousand dollars to, to get a good laptop? Or, or, or what's going on? What's the, what's, the, what's the jig? Not at all. This laptop requirement actually started um, during the pandemic and because of it. Since students were going off campus and they no longer had access to things like the computer labs, uh, students started to notice that they were not really able to complete their schoolwork with that lack of technology. So they reached out to the school and very quickly UTD developed a student loaner program where students could sign up online and schedule to get a laptop that they could use for the semester. So as the pandemic is now looking like it's about to wind down and students are returning back to campus, the UTD administration decided that, you know, now that we've noticed that so many students need laptops and it's so essential for their educational well-being, we want to put in a requirement so that when students come in right from the get-go, they have all the tools that they need to be successful. And to kind of elaborate a little bit more about that, to answer the second half of your question, will it be required? No, no one's going to, you know, have like a security check-in where you have to like scan your laptop in. It's not like that at all. It's more of a educational enablement initiative where they want you to be successful. So let's say you do not have a laptop that meets uh, the standards for your classes where if you took this laptop, you could not complete the assignments in your classes. You have a couple options where, you know, traditionally you could go to the computer labs on campus, uh, but, you know, with this hybrid online thing going on, we don't know how long it's going to go on, but if it does, you know, ever go back to where people are taking online classes, you have this technology loaner program set up where it's set up indefinitely so it's just going to keep going on even after things go in person where okay. just yeah you can you know pick up a laptop from UTD borrow it for a semester and return it at, at no cost to you the student and there's also um, <clears throat> a um, this minimum standard where you have a laptop that you can get from the I believe UTD tech store mm -hmm. where it's little discounted because of their partnership with Dell and you basically you just get that laptop and this is something that they've done some analysis and research on and this is a laptop that will last you four years and I believe they have something like a four-year warranty 
for something that just because they want students to have one laptop for four years that will they can use um, for the entirety of their undergraduate education. And so the goal is not to penalize students who don't have this, but instead to open up access. And so if you don't have like if you don't have the laptops or you don't have the means to them, UTD is developing assistance programs uh, that I believe will come out maybe closer to the fall. They're not there right now, but they are working on this again. So they can really empower students by having the access to technology. Right, so this minimum standard is more like a guideline for, for success, and if you can't buy a laptop with that guideline by yourself, there's the computer loan program to provide that for you? Essentially, yes, but the, um, but the wording that they use is recommendation because it's more, uh, it's not, it's not exactly like, sorry, I, I don't know if I said recommendation. It's not a recommendation, it's a requirement. And they use that phrasing because uh, it's more, um, I talked to uh, Brian Dougherty, who is the chief technology officer. He also does um, part of information technology. And he said that they debated, should we call it a recommendation? Should we call it a requirement? And they, decided that they want to call it a requirement because it sets a stronger precedent and more students are, you know, likely to get the laptop if it's a requirement. And there's a study in 2019 where it says that 9% of college students didn't have access to laptops. So if we kind of think about that figure um, and what it means towards UTD, and the student loaner program has serviced um, a number of students. It has, since its inception, over 1,000 students have been served. So when you think of the population of UTD, um, the majority of them, I believe, uh, you know, do have laptops currently. And so it's sort of like a smaller group. It's not the majority of students need the loaner program or the, you know, come in for the computer labs. Um, so with that in mind, they said, you know, if the majority of students already have laptops. It's not as, it's easier to make it a requirement since you already have it. So it's not imposing as big of a burden, you know? So it'll just be more like get one um, that has, you know, some of the more specific requirements that enable students to keep right, this. Right, right. So, I mean, do they know, does the university know right now this, I guess the the tech that most students have, I guess, because a lot of you know a lot of students have laptops, mm -hmm. but not every student will have a laptop that meets the the minimum spec that they have. Right. Um, so are those students also able to go through the learner program? Oh yes, yes they are. And, so, and then I guess how much, how many how many students can actually get a laptop? the loaner program I guess do we know the kind of operational maximum for this is there is there just like a limit where you're like okay wait we just don't have that many laptops or how does that go yeah and to answer the first part of the question first I don't think they did a survey of students where they could figure out like this is how many students have this this is how many but based off of how many people responded to the student loaner program they had an idea of what the demand for students who want these laptops is. So again, to go back to what I was mentioning to Amanda, this is more of an enablement tool. So the phrasing is a little tricky where it's requirement, but it's really if you have your own laptop and it's not like the exact requirements that's on the website or the UTD requirements, but you do get your work done, you're fine. You do not have to, no one's gonna harass you you know, no one's going to bother you, but they have those requir requirements because based off of their analysis of the UTD programs, they think that you may need, maybe you're doing fine with this laptop your freshman year or sophomore year, when you start your junior or senior year, you may need a laptop that has, you know, more capabilities, something like that. And so again, in this case, this would be about being more proactive. So you start off with a laptop, the last right. few years, um, that's kind of what it is. And to answer the second half of your question, 
um, they had in March of last year, they had, or sorry, currently they have 360 laptops in their program. And the Dowdy, he uh, anticipated that they are going to order around 200 more laptops by this fall. So the number sure. will be closer to 500 laptops uh, at UTD at a given semester. Well, thanks, Alina, for talking with us about uh, the the new laptop standard and uh, how the the lo and how the loaner program is going to work and how how much uh, and how much we we may be able to get from that. Mm -hmm. uh, coming up next, we'll be talking with Sophia Babul about a recent student government uh, meeting and uh, the resolutions and such that came from it. Stick around. We'll be right back. With over a year's worth of online classes, it's been rough to make new friends at university. To wrap up the spring semester, Radio UTD, Chi Alpha Iota, and the Gallerstein Gender Center are hosting a virtual LGBTQ plus mix and mingle event where we'll be playing games, listening to rad queer anthems curated by students, learning about other inclusive orgs on campus, and more. This event will be held on Friday, April 23rd from 6 to 8 p.m. CST on Zoom. The link to register is available on socials for the hosting orgs. Hey y'all, this is Amanda and you're listening to the Mercury Morning News here on RadioUTD.com. Be sure to follow both Radio UTD and UTD Mercury across the board on socials. And also quick, 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 boost, boost, boost. We've got the LGBTQ plus mix and mingle tonight from 6 to 8 p.m. If you haven't registered with the Eventbrite link, it is available on the Comet calendar to find that link right there, as well as I believe we should have posted it at some point on our socials. But that's going to be later tonight. One of our DJs, Daniel Valdez, is going to be doing a live DJ booth during the event, and we've got a lot of other cool breakout rooms. And again, this is partnered with the Gender Center as well as Chi Alpha Iota, which is an LGBTQ plus diternity on campus. It's going to be a fun night. Hope we'll see you all there. But for now, we are doing another story today on Mercury Morning News. And this one is with Sophia Babul, and we are going to be talking about the latest Senate meeting, which was last week on April 13th. So, uh, Sophia, can you give us a rundown of some of the big highlights of that Senate meeting? Yeah, totally. Thanks, Amanda. So, um, yeah, exactly. So on April 13th, um, you know, student government basically had their last Senate meeting. And there were really two important um, breakthroughs that actually came from that meeting. So the first one is that there was one resolution that surrounded the topic of transgender rights um, and how it's, they basically want to go against the Texas legislature's latest Senate bill, Bill 1646. That was the first thing that they talked about. And the second thing that was really important that they talked about was an amendment to a bylaw to provide UTD students with free scantrons. So I guess we can go through this one by one. So the first one was about the transgender rights resolution that the Texas Senate um, basically tried to pass on April 12th, just the day before. Um, this is an anti-trans bill that basically criminalizes um, sex change in children. And in fact, the bill goes so far to state that um, to change the sex of a child would be considered child abuse by the parents of that individual and that would um, basically activate a child protective investigation. So the resolution that came out of the student government stated, and I quote, um, we wanna reaffirm UT Dallas's commitment to protecting all members of the university committee, regardless of race, color, religion, sex, national origin, age, disability, genetic information, veteran status, sexual orientation, gender expression, and gender identity, and they are opposing Bill 1646. So this was a really important moment because River Bloom, who worked um, on this project specifically, said that this bill is actually really similar to one that Arkansas passed um, just um, a while ago. But this is actually worse because this actually characterizes sex change as child abuse, which is not stated in the Arkansas one. It just criminalizes um, a different uh, gender affirming character. So this is um, arguably uh, one of the worst ones. So that was the first resolution surrounding the topic of transgender rights. And that, um, that passed um, during the meeting with a simple majority. Um, the, second thing that, the, the second thing that happened um, during that meeting was an amendment to a bylaw to provide UTD students with free scantrons. This did not pass. Um, that's just because it didn't reach the threshold 
um, for the full votes of the Senate. But the president um, assured me that if this were to go on for next year's, um, um, if this was to become like a conversation for next year, she thinks that it would pass with um, a, a sufficient amount of votes. But basically what um, this amendment is saying is that um, we want to allocate 8% of student government's annual budget, which is about $2,800, for the distribution of Scantron forms for all students. So this would allow for equitable access um, to everybody, and it would basically allow students to pick up as many Scantrons as they want, and it would just prevent any student from having to undergo any type of financial burden or to have to think twice about buying one. Those are the two main stories that came out of um, last week's uh, Senate meeting. Right. And so when it came to the the first one you mentioned for transgender rights, so was that amendment basically the student government saying, hey, we aren't flying with this new Texas legislator statement, like just showing their support in that way? Is that what the amendment was exactly. to do? Exactly. Exactly. So it's just a resolution stating that, hey, um, vote against all bills restricting the rights of transgender people. We it as one of the most inclusive universities for the LGBT community. So it was a very um, simple majority and it totally passed. Right. And I'm ha happy it did because from what how you explain exactly, that new Texas yeah. legislator bill, like, does that mean like pr pretty much now no children or minors in Texas are going to be allowed to go through a sex change? Is that what that bill is stating? or? Yeah, it's basically stating that the uh, the consequences of a sex change are incredibly severe. Um, it, it also went so far as to say that ultimately um, what would happen is the child would be removed from parents' custody and there would be child abuse charges towards the doctor, him or herself, who conducted the surgery. So it basically is trying to... Um, add in so many more hoops for children who um, want to undergo a sex change, and it's just allowing it to become incredibly difficult for them to do so. Great. Thank you for, for clarifying that uh, of course, for our yeah, listeners. Of course. Again, it's nice that the Senate was able to pass that without an issue. Exactly. Um, mm -hmm. I believe River, they are a member of the... Diversity and Equity. And it's um, super cool because um, what River and um, Vignesh have been doing also on the side is that they're trying to institute um, a neutral gender marker on the Galaxy profile, which um, the Galaxy, um, you know, it uses the software called PeopleSoft. It actually allows that to occur. So it would basically allow for a neutral gender marker to, um, to be added so that students who identify as not as non-binary they're able to access that icon to make it as um to make themselves and others basically to express themselves in a way that they they believe is fit for them so that's another cool project right for, and i hope that that gets passed soon even something yeah. small like that really helps with totally. your sense of self yes. and it seems like it would be pretty easy to integrate and it sounds like it's already like a thing you know that other universities with this application have done yeah, exactly. And it's just a matter of activating it. In fact, Galaxy has already added it. It's just a matter of us being able to activate it as UTD students. So the fact that Galaxy and PeopleSoft have already thought about it, I think is a huge step forward for sure. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, it just, that, that will be a big help, especially for incoming students as well yes. to already feel yes. comfortable. Mm -hmm. And especially when they meet their advisors for the first yes, time or even exactly. teachers. That would be such yes. a big help. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Totally. Now, the, the next meeting, that is going to be on May 4th with the newly elected student government officials, Correct. right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. It'll be the president and vice president, and they'll bring an entire new administration, and we'll be able to see the different amendments and resolutions that they'll pass, but then also um, whether or not the Scantron um, bylaw amendment comes back into play. Right. Yeah, I almost we the the beginning of the the student government meeting made me forget about the Scantron part, but I hope that gets passed. Yeah, it was actually really interesting because um, the individual who was proposing it, Ian, um, he is actually a senior. So when he was talking about kind of the motivation behind it, he was 
basically talking about this idea of um, equitable access to all students of all backgrounds. And basically what would happen is about 8% of student um, government's budget, which is about $2,800, would be, would be um, given into providing scantrons for free. And there would ba basically just be like a pickup location, for example, Green Hall or near the UTD um, bookstore, whatever it may be, where students can just pick up scantrons and however many blue books that they need and um, they wouldn't have to worry about paying for it. So it was a really interesting um, amendment to the bylaw, but it would have to, I guess the logistics of it would have to be kind of, um, you know, thought through a little bit more just to see how this would actually play out. Yeah, for sure. I feel like the best, for, what, at least in, in my head, the best the plan would be to like just distribute them right before a scheduled exam or something. Yeah, exactly. And, I, you know, that is a great idea. And what, you know, a lot of the um, concern across the board about the specific amendment was the fact of like, well, now that we're virtual and maybe not all exams will be in person anymore, how do we deal with that? Or if I'm a student and I have, um, you know, I have six exams in the next month or the next two months, um, can I pick up, if I pick up 12, is that accounted for in the budget, right? So there's a lot of um, distribution questions and a little bit more about like how this would actually work budget wise, but I think it's a very kind of noble idea, you know? Yeah, for sure. I mean, for sure, shout out to all the, the classmates in the past that have been that person with the extra scantrons exactly. when someone forgets yes. it. Like for sure. All the praise to those peeps. All the but praise. it still would it still would be great to just have that available and ready and I feel like they, they, they probably would be able to set something up with both teachers and the testing center especially. Yeah I think so too. I think that there is a way to do this in a way that's like smart and um, kind of regulated just to ensure that you know just to make sure that it if hopefully if we're if the goal is equitable access it really is doing that you know for the students that actually need it they're able to have this like location that's kind of designated beforehand even if it's like just your own exam room like just like passing on scantrons as soon as you enter the door like if your TA just has them holding um like holding them and just kind of passing them out as students come through like I would feel like that would be the the smartest thing to do as you were saying um just to make sure that um no student is getting more than they need and that way there's more for everyone at the end of the day for the next Senate meeting, so we, so we mentioned that it's going to be like the new new student government. Are there any members that are staying on? Some of the senators are coming back. Some will be seniors, such as Ian. Um, Ian Barry will, will be a senior, I believe, and he'll be heading out. But I don't know about other specific members, but um, I was assured that a lot of the senators are staying. Um, one example, I believe, is like um, Kruthi Kanjuri, who is currently a freshman senator. Um, and it's it's really interesting because so a lot of these senators who are freshmen have not even been on campus yet. So I wonder what kind of unique experiences they're going to bring having not been on campus yet, having not had a physical campus experience. I wonder if they're going to bring an interesting perspective to the physical experience um, to, because of they've been virtual so long. So I think it'll be exciting and I think it'll be kind of cool. I guess I guess on top of that, all right, I mean... I assume, like the May Fourth one is going to be virtual, right? Like, yeah, it's not I okay. So, yeah, okay. It's like yeah, we're, we're slowly so. opening up, but I don't think it's going to be that soon. Yeah, yeah, I don't think it'll be that soon. I guess like for the fall or so, or like a little bit more down the line. I think it'll be interesting to see what kind of perspectives these these ver these senators who have only been virtual are going to kind of bring out. So, I think it'll be interesting. <laughs> excited to see what changes they're going to implement exactly. and how, especially with this new input like what, what you said from these online semesters to how that yeah. will help the I guess traditional back to school format that we're probably all gonna get back into hopefully I'm really hoping some of the accommodations Hope, yes. that have happened mm -hmm. during the virtual semester stay um, yes for sure but uh, thank you again Sophia for interviewing with us this week Oh, my pleasure. All right, everybody. Welcome back to the Mercury Morning News. As a reminder, you're listening on RadioUTD.com, 
You can follow us at Radio UTD on all social media platforms. And you can follow us at UTD Mercury on all social media platforms, except for MySpace. I don't know, you know, I don't know <laughs> if you would use MySpace. I don't know why you would. But um, we're not on there. So don't don't follow don't follow anybody on that. Just just use just use a different social platform. <laughs> but for right now, I'm gonna be talking to Team Captain Mars Marcel, uh, Pichu Main of the the Smash Ultimate Team, coming off <laughs> coming hot off the backs of a back to back national championship win, and also casually taking first place in two other tournaments. How's mm-hmm. it going? Pretty great. Pretty hyped about both those things for sure. <laughs> All right. So, um, I guess, uh, how? So, leading up to the uh, the the finals, the playoffs for nationals, uh, y'all were also you know still fighting in what is what you guys are calling Greg's League, basically. Mm-hmm. And um, so, how did that? How did the bracket run go in, in both of those tournaments? I guess. Um. Oh man, I got the the people mixed up in in both those. Uh, it's understandable. Though. It's, it's mm-hmm. a lot of it's a lot of smash to worry about when when you've already won, right? <laughs> yeah. But um, I I think you you mentioned a while back. Um, MSU. Yeah, MSU was the one that we had to beat for CSL Grand Finals. Um, I'm trying to think real quick. <sighs> Sorry, one sec. No worries. I want to know what school Twig was from. Because there was this Pikachu player named yeah. Twig. And our team, most of our team does not do very good against Pikachu in general. Pikachu is the best character in the game, obviously. Almost non-disputable. Everybody almost agrees on this. It's like kind of well known at this point there's a few people that disagree but it's whatever people people think pikachu is good regardless to top tier that's fine all of our team are very not confident against pikachu including me i i'm probably like okay into pikachu but everybody else is like okay maybe even probably losing so that was one of our biggest concerns against the pikachu but i don't remember if it was against MSU or Illinois, it's been already like a couple weeks. <laughs> this is fair. This is it. It has been a few weeks since it all mm-hmm. since it all went down. Um, but uh, yeah, so I guess yeah, it was it was Illinois. I, I just saw. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Twigs, 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 the starter for Illinois. Okay, so then against Illinois, that means we played them in Collegiate Star League. Yeah. So that means we played them in that one, yeah. or in a uh, Greg's League. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, and, and Greg's like not not CSO. I mean, you for, did both. Yeah. It looks like we we did play them. Okay, so actually, uh, whenever we played them in CSL, uh-huh. we we kind of did way better against them. I think in in CSL, but in uh, Greg's league, it was a little. It was very much close. It, it was very close, and it was a uh, grand final, so it was it was pretty scary. Right, and we were we were already in losers, so we had. We, I think we had to win twice. Right. So that was that was scary. That was pretty scary having to play them twice in a row. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I remember now. We had to play their team twice. Oh my goodness! And both times they were incredibly close. All right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That is yeah. That is it. Yeah. So then I I guess timeline wise, what happened first? Uh, Greg's league or, or CSL? Gary? I believe CSL came first. My well, uh, we played against Michigan. In Greg's league, the week before CSL finals, oh. so we lost against Michigan, right? And then we had to play against Michigan in uh, in CSL for winners finals of CSL, right? And then uh, and then for grand finals too, and for grand finals as well because they came back, right? Uh, but we we had won twice against them, basically. Crazy. So we, we got the download after Greg's league after we lost the one time. And then we had to play them again in Greg's League in Losers Finals, I believe, or something like that. And then we, we won again and had to go to Grand Finals against uh, Illinois. Bam. Mm-hmm. Smashing both of them, though. Getting getting both. They were very good. Like, it could have gone either way, but 
we we prevailed twice in a row. Yeah, well, I you guess know, we played twice, Michigan three times. Twice then. in a row, twice in a row, right? Yeah. Because at, at this yeah. point, you won the winners' finals, then the grand finals against MSU for the CSL, mm-hmm. and then in Greg's league. You win the the losers finals and then the grand finals. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It was very very stressful. We all pulled out in the end. Everybody is so good at keeping their mindset like solid. That's that's one of my biggest faults. Is I get so stressed out, but everybody on the team is so like they have such good mindsets, and I envy them for them. I envy them about that, man. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So so of all of your chill teammates, who who. Who would you say were the the MP, MVPs? Um, definitely, I think Fox did. Okay, okay, Fox and Akito. Akito clutched it. I believe in. Uh, ah, I think it was CSL. He had to take. I think five stocks in the last one. He he, like, he was left with five stocks and he clutched it out. So close. It was actually looking so bad for us, but he he got that up till where they were both at last stock, last hit, last game, last everything. Oh down God. to the wire and he found that kill it was so sick we were all screaming our heads off it was crazy um and fox fox was our like go-to like he he was in like every single lineup right he he does very good online so we we send him into every single lineup even if he doesn't even like the matchups <laughs> yeah but we'll send him in like no you're going <laughs> uh, <laughs> because he's he's very good like people don't know how to deal with terry yet and he he's still good like he will take stocks even if he doesn't like the matchup, as opposed to what me or or other people that are very counterpickable, you know. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. I guess uh, so. You you have Fox with the Terry, being yes. the the kind of the standard the Rock and Akito as well, the, mm-hmm. the the Snake, if I recall. Yes, the Snake. Yeah. Very talented. Very nasty. <laughs> yeah. He. Yeah. So I guess um, in in all of these games as well. So, um, what is it? So for you, I guess how how were your matchups? How were your matches? Um, I actually. So I'm I'm like my peach is very volatile, you know. So I. I'm saved for counter picks. I'm not necessarily sent in every single time because Pichu is not the best character in the game. He's like mid tier or something like that. So whenever I did go in, I think in grand finals I only took two stocks twice. I I I was the starter, which like usually Pichu would not be a very good starter, but against their whole lineup I was like even to maybe winning. So they're like, "Okay, well, if you can take at least two into whoever because everybody else can be counter picked, but my Pichu had almost even matchups with everybody. So if I could just take two and then we get counter pick advantage there after that, that would be fantastic. So I did my job both times pretty much. I mean, I could have taken three and I I still wish to this day that I had taken three and performed better, but I still did my job. Like I, I didn't I didn't mess it up for my team. I got two stocks and then we got counter pick and then whenever the next person came in, they would take the one stock without dropping it and then it'd be back to even. Four stocks or four people versus four people at that point. Right, right. Mm-hmm. So I guess you know going in as the the kind of the what is it the the kamikaze go for the two stock get in get out. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, both uh, the last stocks that I I couldn't take were were so close to. I, I came back. I'm like, oh man, I'm sorry guys. I could have gotten that third stock, but but they they clutched it. They're they're all talented. They all took many many stocks. They're so good. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess for you, after this, we, we, you've won three tournaments this semester. Yeah, uh, including the back to back Nats where you won. You went offline, and then it all got shifted online. Oh man, yeah. The garbage netcode of <laughs> Smash yeah, Ultimate. Yeah, so bad. And uh, but now we're here. So mm-hmm. what does it what does it look like? I guess for you going forward, you are a, a the end of sophomore year right now, or um pretty much yeah. yeah. I'm the end end of fourth semester, so it'd be end of sophomore year for me, pretty much yeah. Right. So I mean, you've got. A few more semesters to go. Right? Mm-hmm. So what is so what does it look like for you? Are you just gonna keep going at it and you keep you know hopefully getting some more dubs? Do you think you would ever add on another character, or 
For me, oh man, I have tried playing different characters. I've tried picking up Ike. I've tried picking up Wolf. I've tried those two mainly. But I, I just don't have as much fun as I do with Pichu. And you really don't improve in a game unless you're having fun, is, is what I like to say, right? Like, improving like comes almost naturally if you're having fun, right? right. So I, I've stuck with Pichu this whole time and i don't think i'll be picking up a different character i've been i've been seeing some success recently even more success than usual uh with pichu and now that offline tournaments are slowly coming back there's actually a, a tournament happening tonight that i was watching before coming to the interview uh nice. offline tournament that i i wish i could have gone to uh I'll, I'll be back to playing offline very very soon once i'm vaccinated and once everybody else gets more vaccinated once the populace becomes more vaccinated and more i don't know once herd immunity becomes more viable Yep. Once tournaments come back, realistically, I'll, I'll be able to come back and play offline like I want to. <laughs> and the online chapter for Smash Brothers is about to come to a close. I see. I, I, see. I think, I think the, all of the Smash team is relieved to hear that as well. Relieved to go back to offline. Do you think like online events would continue at all? Oh, Once, definitely like... for sure. Um, they will, but not to the scale as it was before. Like, they're, they're going to be few and far between. Like, a lot of them were hosted because just to hold people over until o offline came back, right? Everybody wants to see offline. Nobody really cares that much about online. But right. there will still be online events. All right. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, I guess throughout this offline online thing, what what are you... What where does Pichu actually place, do you think? I know the game, it's a very large game, right? It's mm -hmm. not like... You know, like League has their, you know, Diamond Dozen metas with like, you know, like maybe 20 champions are viable this time, a different 20 are viable this time, and like, you know, you know, Overwatch has, you know, their metas come and go, mm -hmm. Rocket League is Rocket Cars, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But Smash has legitimately like at least 40 or, or, or so, at least like viable 70 plus characters, character. right? Mm -hmm. So, so where does Pichu fall into that? Okay, I have very think? strong opinions about this, and I <laughs> I like to repeat this a lot because okay. people just don't understand. People don't understand Pichu. Okay, okay. So Pichu online is a bad character, very bad character. One because Pichu is a very precise character, requires uh, a a very good reaction time to play, and you have to be pretty precise, right? Online does not promote precise play because there's input delay. So Pichu online, I'd say, is probably bottom. 20 being generous pichu is really bad online i and like i don't mean to my own horn or anything but yeah i i still do like okay online i still prefer offline i do need to get used to it but offline pichu has so much potential pichu can realistically kill anybody at like almost any percent if you're just good enough right but you have to be precise about it you have to be really really good with your inputs and awesome. online does not help Offline, you're not hindered by any input delay. So offline, I'd say Pichu would be top 20. I see. Probably top 20, I'd say. Is so Online, bottom 20, on, or I'm sorry, yeah. Online, bottom 20, offline, top 20. All right. So I guess, just curious, um, what can Pichu do? Like, what what is like at least one thing Pichu can do offline that's just like nutty? That you just can't, you couldn't ever pull off online. Um, one thing is for sure. Well, there, there, there's a couple of things, right? For example, uh, IDJ, which stands for Instant Double Jump. Uh, there's a ton of IDJ combos that have been recently labbed out for Pichu that I've been dying to try, but they're so precise. It's like an instant double jump from a short hop or from jump squat. So you have to jump like the frame after your jump is over from the ground, and that gives you more height. Right. And it allows you to have more combos in general. I, to put it simply, uh, online, well, re that input is very difficult to begin with. Online, you can't really react to a combo starter. You kind of have to assume you hit it sometimes. Mm -hmm. Offline, if I hit a down tilt, I'm like, oh, I hit a down tilt. I'm going to start an IDJ combo and just right. go for it. So uh, a P2 IDJ combo could look like down tilt, Reverse aerial rush, IDJ up air into delayed landing nair into IDJ up air, delayed landing nair into 
up air, fast fall, down V, and they'd be dead, or something something like that. Like, something really precise, but it could get you the kill very, very early. All or right. IDJ, up air, up air, down V, off the stage. That that would kill at zero, for sure. Something but, like that. Yeah, that input is really hard to do, of course. So offline play would be better, uh, way easier to do than online. Obviously. Well, Mars, thanks for talking with me. Uh, coming right up, we've got some new music coming for you. So stick around. You don't want to miss it. Afterwards, we'll have some music news that Amanda's got lined up. So stick around. You don't want to miss any of that. And thanks to Mars for doing the interview. Mm-hmm. This is Amanda, and you're either listening to Mercury Morning News or you're watching this interview on YouTube right now. We have been lucky enough to have gotten in communication and been able to interview Simone today. Very, very new to the station. We haven't done a pseudo stereo with her in the past, but she's producing really cool stuff right now, and we want to be able to talk about some of her newest releases and such. So to start that off, as, as we mentioned, this is, this is our first conversation with you ever, so we're going to have a bit of ground to cover. With, with Pink, Pink Clouding, um, later this year you're planning to release your first EP after the rain. Can, can you tell us what we should look forward to in that EP? Will it be songs similar to Pink Clouding? Or are you going to be experimenting with different emotions or genres? And also, is that sparkling cider song going to show up? You know about Sparkling Cider, yay! Okay, uh, yeah, Sparkling Cider is a, um, a song that I wrote a while ago, and I posted a little clip of it on my Instagram. Um, I've had that question, I've had a lot of people ask me to release that. Um, unfortunately, it's not on the EP, but I definitely plan to release that as a, as a single. 
sometime after that. Um, but yeah, it's uh, as far as After the Rain goes, definitely very honest. Um, it's a collection of five songs. Um, and I really tried to, to tell a story with that, that EP. I think a lot of albums, um, while I think things are changing a little bit now in terms of how honest people are being, um, a lot of times albums have uh, tended to be just a collection of songs and not to say that that's bad, but the the albums that I always gravitated towards um, told a story. Like my favorite albums are are um, After the Internet by Childish Gambino um, and Bad by, by Michael Jackson. Um, and and uh, like Songversation by Indiari, and they all kind of they they tell a narrative, and especially the the Gambino album. Um, so I tried to do something similar with that. After the rain, um, the reason why I called it that is because I, it's 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 you know about what happens after the rain falls. What happens after these, um, after you kind of hit the ground and 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 the journey of finding yourself afterwards. Yeah. Oh, we love we love it, narrative albums here, even if it's like an obvious narrative or more like stitching together a common theme or feeling mm-hmm. so the listener can take it, you know, to their own extent. When you were in Dallas, what stuck out to you most about the Dallas music scene? I, I grew up in an oil province and in an oil city. Um, so there wasn't much opportunity for music, especially... Um, as an R&B artist, a pop R&B artist. So um, when I when I got there, I used to, um, my, my friend um, who lives there, he had taken me to this, I um, forgot what area it was, but it was somewhere in downtown. And there were just a bunch of rest of like late night restaurants. And at the same time, they were all playing jazz concerts. And it was it was just so cool to, to, to see that. Um, so it was really it was really um, really cool to to be around that um, and really encouraging. Um, and and there's just so much passion. Um, there was this there was this like I think we we went to this um, restaurant that had all <laughs> I don't remember the name, but I remember we had fried chicken there, and there was this jazz band playing, and they were amazing. And and um, when I spoke to them afterwards, they were just just so passionate, um, and even the UTD students that I that I'd met who were uh, pursuing music and, and pursuing audio engineering, um, yeah, I, I I loved the passion that I saw. Glad glad to hear that. Um, proud proud of the DFW music scene. <laughs> it's a good time. Hmm. Twenty twenty one. Let's. We, we can't wait for, for live concerts and just be yes. able to, oh to meet goodness. artists like you in person. Oh. oh, I miss it so much. I also, um, I miss the food in Dallas as well. Understandable. Oh my goodness. Oh. Could you give us some background on what started you on this trajectory of becoming a musician like was it a very strong part of your childhood growing up or did it become like a later in life interest definitely something I um I grew up around my dad was a Pakistani and a Sufi artist um and Sufi music is Islamic devotional music so I I grew up watching him perform and and he used to have all these concerts when when I was a kid um and it really like music was the first thing I heard when I was came out the womb I guess um and I was so just fascinated by my dad and um he would like every night practice upstairs um he was he was a he was a musician and an, an engineer so after work um after he'd like especially on weekends he would just go to our music room and, and practice and I would always come and interrupt and try to sing with him and when we'd come back from his concerts, I would, we have this staircase where you go up and then there's a platform and you turn and you go um, all the way up. And that platform was my stage and I'd make everyone watch me perform. Um, and so my dad saw that, um, that passion in me. 
um, and the same passion that he had. So he would bring me up on stage with him and I'd get to perform with him and um, put me in music classes and piano classes and all these like art classes um, and would scout for, for performances for me to, to participate in and, and just opportunities to, to really nurture um, this passion. Um, so I grew up doing a lot of talent shows and, and community performances um so it 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 was music was always there and um on top of that my my parents were just huge lovers of music so it wasn't it wasn't just one type of music that was playing in our house my dad loved Michael Jackson and Stevie Wonder and uh the Carpenters and Jackson 5 and my mom loved Whitney Houston and ABBA um so we had we had a, a very diverse selection of, of music playing in our in our house um, on top of, you know, semi-classical Indian music and Pakistani music and Sufi music. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a, a huge part of, of my, my childhood and young adulthood. <clears throat> and so I, I always knew that I wanted to, to become, um, an artist. Just what's, what's the best way for listeners, viewers to, you know, keep in contact with your updates as an artist? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, my Instagram is the best place. Uh, you can follow me at, at I'm Simone, and that's um, not I am, it's I'm. Um, I usually post everything on there, and I'll be launching my website as well. Um, as soon as the music video releases, which will release in a, in a few weeks, I'll be making the announcement soon. Um, and as far as trips to DFW, I will be making a trip in August. Um, as well to 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 visit my my family but um i will i'm trying to plan some like virtual uh concerts and stuff although it is yeah difficult <laughs> with with covid but um yeah just just writing a lot of a lot of music still which is bizarre cuz i haven't even released my my ep yet but um definitely lots of music to come and yeah follow me on instagram you'll be able to to get all the updates on when everything's dropping. And thank you again so much for talking with us today. Thank I'm you. Very excited to listen to that EP in the future. Um, so excited. I'm just. <laughs> Me too. I, yeah, I am off the rails about this EP. So I'm also very excited. Thank you so much for your, for your time. Um, and, it was really fun speaking to you. Okay, y'all, that'll be it for our music news section for this week. I hope y'all enjoyed that. It is just an excerpt of the full interview, which will premiere on our YouTube next week as well as on stream next week as well. The interview in full was about 20, 30 minutes, so we just gave you a little snippet right now, and if you'd like to hear more about Simone, be sure to tune in on our YouTube or on our stream next week. Anyways, I hope y'all enjoyed today's show, and have a good Mercury morning. Mm -hmm.